Thank you. So welcome to the uh, seminar of the Sonia Steny Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Today's speaker is Marcelo Guzman. So let me tell you a bit about Marcelo. Marcelo comes from Argentina. He was educated at the National University in Tucumán, in Argentina, where he got his Bachelor in Science in Chemistry. Then he went to uh, Caltech. You know where Caltech is, the California Institute of Ethnology in Pasadena, where he got his Master of Science in Environmental Science and Engineering, and also he got his doctorate in 2007 in the same discipline, in Environmental Science and Engineering, under the, uh, his advisor was uh, Professor Mike Hoffman, a well-known person in water chemistry. And now Marcelo is, is came from us, not from Pasadena, but from Boston. He is a postdoc at Harvard University, working with Scott Martin, and is working on some, something very interesting about the origin of lives. But he promised today we're going to talk about engineering, so I'm going, without further ado, leave the floor to Marcelo. Marcelo. Thank you very much, JP. And, uh, I would like to say the talk uh, is going to be divided into... Oh, thank you. Oh, no. I need to get the... Thank you, Marcelo. <laughs> Where do I go? Thank you. No, no, this is yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're fighting with technology, and only, uh, but we are recording. No, thank, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be here in Southern California again. Uh, in your university and uh, my talk is going to be divided in two uh, the first half will be mainly postdoctoral research with some ideas of future uh, research uh, it's prebiotic metabolism the second half will be more about my PhD in uh, environmental photochemistry uh, relevant for atmospheric aerosol so uh, it's a great topic to be working right now uh, origins of life astrobiology because two Nobel Prizes were given to this research area last year. A third of the award was uh, for Jack Shostak, a Harvard professor, for his discovery of how telomerases work, uh, their universality in uh, reproduction of uh, eukaryotic cells. Another third of the chemistry Nobel Prize, that was medicine, this one is chemistry, was awarded to Anna Yonath from the Weizmann Institute for her, dis her discovery of how the ribosomes work, the, the machinery of proteins and the engineering that is involved in, in this research. Now, the first problem any scientist will face when uh, working the origins of life is that of uh, the emergence or the evolution from geochemistry to biochemistry, from an abiotic environment to a biotic environment. That will be represented, for example, by the polymerisa polymerization of amino acids, monomers, amino acids, that get polymerized into proteins. So amino acids were generated by uh, Miller in his famous uh, Miller experiment, his science 1953 paper, were from single organic compounds and uh, in, sorry single inorganic compounds he obtained amino acids he had a, 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 an experimental design like this one in a reservoir half full of water that represented the ocean he induced evaporation water vapor was directly into a second container that had ammonia hydrogen and methane and there were two electrodes to produce uh, spark discharges to simulate lighting and organic uh, products were condensed back and trickled back into the original reactor. This experiment was kept for one week running continuously and the surprise was that 15% of the methane uh, carbon was now fixed as organics and 2% uh, of those were amino acids. Now the main critic Miller uh, experiments had later was that uh, the atmosphere was not reducing so there was no uh, ammonia, no methane, no hydrogen, uh, but it was more uh, neutral. Another uh, problem is that life is highly organized and this experiment did not provide 
any organization and it did not provide any mechanism of polymerization to produce the proteins and the biomolecules necessary for life. So let's take a look of the early Earth environment. You have to to think if we are here by 0.46 billion years ago, the Earth was already consolidated as a planet. Uh, the atmosphere was mainly composed by uh, nitrogen, CO2, CO. Uh, there was no ozone because there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. 100 million years later, methane was completely blown off at the time of the moon forming impact. And there was reduced luminosity of the young sun, young sun 30% less luminosity than present levels. You have to think there was a young sun, but there was no ozone layer. So there was a deeper wavelength, uh, irradiation wavelength, reaching the Earth's uh, surface. Uh, between 3.8 and 3.9 billion years ago, there was the period of late heavy bombardment that represented a real challenge to the origin of survival of life. And immediately after that, we have the first evidence by 3.7, 3.5 billion years ago of a uh, microbial life, M life that should have been autotrophic. Uh, these first microorganisms were able to fix CO2 from the, uh, from the atmosphere. And this is very important from our uh, present problem with, uh, with fuels. So th there was early on Earth a, a problem. There was not enough organics. How this uh, the prebiotic environment evolution, uh, has undergone the evolution process to uh, generate the early fuels. So the picture in the background are those stromatolites in, uh, located in shallow water uh, in Western Australia. And if you cut them, you'll find those first uh, in the cross sections, those early microorganisms. From there to the right, we have evolutionary processes very relevant to understand and uh, correlate with the origins of life. But I've been focusing this problem, what was the first carbon fixation uh, of life? And uh, this is a 5,000th time uh, magnification of one of those uh, microorganisms uh, located in those stromatolites that were in the background picture in the previous slides. And nowadays there are six carbon fixation mechanisms that uh, uh, life uh, uses with the help of enzymes. The Calvin cycle is the, the more important in the present, but uh, uh, we can discard them because there was no oxygen. And for different reasons, uh, including what's found in the most ancient microorganisms, uh, the reductive tricarboxylic acid cycle has been proposed as the original uh, mechanism of carbon fixation in early Earth. Uh, now my question for future research would also include this one at the bottom that I, I left it in uh, in a way that it's hard to read actually, but it's a simpler mechanism possible because I will show this research, but I will leave the open question of can we s fix carbon in a minimal walk using combination of the steps provided by central metabolism. Uh, what is the reductive tricarboxylic acid cycle? It's a very simple cycle uh, where acetate and uh, two carbon compounds will get cycled through uh, three carbons, four carbon, five carbon compounds into citrate, the most uh, complex one. It's a tricarboxylic acid cycle. There are uh, uh, carboxylations, there are reductions, uh, uh, hydrations, uh, dehydrations, and uh, all these steps require energy. For example, the steps number one through five re uh, require reducing uh, energy. Uh, a lot has been said previously that this cycle would be uh, impossible to be uh, driven abiotically. Because nowadays the cycle operates in the forward direction. So now we are trying to operate it in the, uh, in the reverse direction. More commonly nowadays you will find the cycle running in the forward direction to yield ATP through the carboxylations. But early bacteria, some bacteria that live nowadays, they can also use the cycle as their engine of metabolism because uh, amino acids can be generated through transamination reactions, lipids through the malonate pathway, and some of the bases for genetic uh, material can be synthesized from the cycle. So Wojcherhauser, a German-born uh, uh, scientist and lawyer, 
proposed that this cycle could have occurred thanks to the catalysis provided by minerals like uh, iron disulfide during the during the formation of iron uh, disulfide pyrite a lot of energy is released and he proposed a, a um, surface metabolism still he could not provide significant yields for driving reactions of the cycle the best he he provided was pyru uh, was lactate and alpha ketocarbo an alpha uh, hydroxy acids related to pyruvate with uh, very small concentrations of 0 0.1 to 1 micromolar. Then Kalapos explained that a, a, an original problem uh, is how to provide the molecules to run the cycle. And he suggested that you could oxidize lactate to pyruvate. I will show the, the structures of the compounds soon. And he uh, studied the thermodynamics and that still requires a lot of energy. Uh, Cody ran also experiments at very high pressure, very high temperatures, and his yields were very low. He, he had yields of 0.07% pyruvate, investing a lot of energy trying to simulate uh, deep water hydrothermal bands uh, chemistry. So for those difficult reductions, we propose to use photo photoelectrochemistry. What's the principle of photoelectrochemistry? So if you remember those steps number one through five, they require a lot of energy. If you have a semiconductor mineral uh, upon absorption of a photon, an electron is promoted from the balance band to the conduction band. This electron has a lot of reducing energy and can reduce, for example, CO2 to form it. We have also observed the formation of carbon-carbon coupling uh, compounds like acetate and propionate. That would be an analogy of the Miller experiments to form the prebiotic uh, soup of organic compounds. Now at the same time you will have a, an oxidizing hole and you need to sacrifice something to complete the, the photoelectrochemical circuit and that's the compound we have been using, H2S, that will get oxidized to polysulfoxian ions like sulfate. And this would be the example of spheralite that it's zinc sulfide. Zinc sulfide absorbs at 344 nanometers. It has a very negative conduction band that can reduce uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere. Uh, these are uh, some of the candidate minerals. Manganese sulfide, based on the band gap, would also be excellent to drive reductions. Cadmium sulfide, that is not in this table, will also be excellent. And I see applications for fuels productions. Now, uh, iron sulfide seems to not be so good. Depending on what you are trying to produce, probably you can uh, uh, reduce CO to formaldehyde. These are some photos of the mineral, the way the minerals are present in nature. Uh, manganese sulfide, zinc sulfide, spheralite, this is alavandite. And this is our photochemical reactor. A reactor, uh, zinc sulfide is white, we prepare colloids in the laboratory. Now, you have to very be very careful uh, driving this chemistry because you can have photocorrosion. And uh, that's a typical uh, example of uh, photocorrosion. That means you have not been very careful running your reactions. Uh, we have done surface studies characterization of our uh, synthesized colloids through a transmission electron microscopy, X-ray diffraction dynamic like scattering, and uh, uh, all the techniques agree that we, uh, we prepare micron to sub uh, nano size uh, particles that have very, very special uh, photochemical activity. The XRD uh, has very broad bands that uh, mean there is a lack of long range crystalline structure uh, and this is the reason why we have special photochemical activity in freshly prepared zinc sulfide. Uh, if you have to think where this kind of chemistry could have occurred in the early Earth, this is a photo of an environment that exists uh, nowadays. It's Crater Maya Bight, the Kuril Islands, north of Japan, Russian uh, territory under uh, dispute uh, after World War II. And uh, this, is, this is real, it exists, and it should have been much more abundant common environment in the early Earth. And this is a photo at 20 meters depth where you can see outgassing, outgassing of H2S. 
and a bacterial mat uh, uh, growing at this depth with light where light can easily penetrate. And I think we can reproduce very well in the laboratory these conditions in our photoelectrochemical uh, reactor. And the concentration of reducing gases and metals you will find in this environment, it's an order of magnitude above typical concentrations found in, uh, in, uh, open, uh, in the open ocean. These are the uh, phenomena uh, that you will observe in this kind of environment. You will have CO2 exchange between the atmosphere and the seawater. Uh, you will have gases and fluids and rich in, uh, in uh, metals being ejected from, uh, from the thermal vents, going through bottom sediments at temperatures between 4 and 90 degrees C. And once you have this enrichment of reducing gases and metals, you will have precipitation of those uh, sulfides, manganese sulfide, cadmium sulfide, zinc sulfide, that will remain in suspension for a certain time, or will deposit in shallow sediments of depth of 20 to 200 uh, meters, that's the uh, category that shallow water hydrothermal vents are included, up to 200 meters depth, where you will have a UV light that can penetrate, interact with those minerals, with CO2 from the exchange of gases, and with the organics that are fixed through any kind of mechanism. This mechanism, the, the Miller uh, kind of experiments mechanism, or organics from extraterrestrial sources. And this is the cycle we are trying to, to prove that it can be driven abiotically without enzymes before the existence of life. So this is the summary of what I will be showing now. We'll be going from CO2 directly into the compounds in the cycle. The right rectangle has the cycle that has been proposed as the engine for uh, initial life for storage in energy. And here is my equivalent to an apleurotic pathway to provide uh, initial compounds to the cycle. An apleurotic from anapleroticos that uh, means to fill up the metabolic cycle. And so let's start with this uh, reaction in blue. So Higgins, who has been an active researcher working with zinc sulfide until his last paper in 1998, that it's a review, has shown how to go directly from CO2 that can be reduced to CO2 minus radical into dimers like oxalate. Through redox chemistry, you can then obtain glyoxylate and glycolate. So this glyoxylate is very interesting synthetically. Uh, we have to think about the engineering applications because of this carbonyl uh, group. It can, uh, uh, it can be very uh, useful synthetically. And what I did was to take this compound and see if we could carboxylate. And we, th we have succeeded, although in lower yields than other reactions, only 15%, it's orders of magnitude higher than what Cody or Wetscherhauser with his co-worker Hoover in Germany have uh, obtained with yields of below 1%. And this study has a very demanding controls, not only the experiments, but you have to test one by one every condition the presence of your initial organic compound, of your colloid, you, uh, the, the use of light or not, of CO2, and the whole scavenger that uh, was H2S. So these are the positives and negatives, and basically we have succeeded, and we have proved that you can go through a train of reactions directly from CO2 all the way to lactate, a three carbon compounds, and now I'm going to show how we can oxidize this lactate to obtain the first compound relevant for metabolism, for carbon fixation in uh, original life. Uh, again, we have a very complex uh, table of conditions where we will start with lactate or with pyruvate or with both simultaneously. And uh, very complex analytical techniques like a liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, gas chromatography mass spectrometry can be used for the analysis of these compounds, but sometimes you have to go simpler. And ion chromatography is an excellent technique where you can separate a large amount of metabolites and uh, identify them and quantify them with, uh, with standards. So here, for example, we have an experiment where, where lactate decreases over time, while formate coming from 
uh, CO2 uh, fixation is being produced and, la and uh, pyruvate is being produced from lactate through oxidation and later decreases. Later, you see here also the appearance of uh, succinate, glutarate. Here you have SO3 to minus, SO4 to minus, uh, bicarbonate. Here there is a shoulder for alpha ketoglutarate. This is thiosulfate and this is uh, isocitrate. So we are seeing many compounds relevant to metabolism that were unexpected. The analysis of alpha ketoglutarate is a little more complex because the peak overlaps with sulfate. So we have to repeat the analysis uh, by precipitation of the sulfate with barium salt, with barium hydroxide, or using special solid phase uh, extraction uh, cartridges with uh, active barium, or also using dilution techniques. And we have confirmed that uh, two uh, oxoglutarate or alpha ketoglutarate was one of our products. And this is basically all the results of, the, of those chromatograms where you, you are following the oxidation of lactate into pyruvate. So you see how lactate disappears while pyruvate gets produced and later starts to be consumed. And alpha ketoglutarate seems to follow the behavior of a of uh, pyruvate. You have also isocitrate, glutarate, succinate, acetate, and in this case formate coming directly from CO2. So I now move into the next step. We have produced the first compound of the cycle and we are trying to see now what's the chemistry of pyruvate in our photoelectrochemical system, of course without enzymes, and we are going to see now the conversion of pyruvate to alpha ketoglutarate. Uh, this is uh, the decrease of pyruvate. It seems there is a delay and later uh, alpha ketoglutarate is produced with very high yields, while lactate is also produced what, uh, with, with lower yields than when lactate was used to produce pyruvate. So you had previously an oxidation of lactate to pyruvate with 70% yield. Now the back reaction, the reduction of pyruvate to lactate uh, proceeds with only 30% yields, what it means there is a, a preference for the oxidation pathway. Uh, isocitrate is produced with lower yields, and here in the organic sum I uh, include all the compounds in the, in the reaction, assuming their uh, stoichiometries, and it seems that our carbon stay constant over the four uh, hours of the experiment, what it means we are accounting pretty much for all the uh, compounds being produced the, or that disappear in the, in the reactions. Now, in real nature, you will never have a single compound. Once you have lactate or pyruvate, you will always end up having the other one because of the redox chemistry I shown. So I decided to run a third experiment on the controls where you start by a, a mixture of the, both of them. A pyruvate will decrease slower than lactate and you will have the production of alpha ketoglutarate. Again, it seems our carbon mass balance is pretty good during the course of the reaction. And I think that's very important from the engineering point of view to know where your carbon is going and that you can account for the, for the chemistry uh, occurring there. We have correlated the the products versus the reactants of, of, of all those reactions and it seems, for example, that 2-oxoglutarate, alpha-ketoglutarate, it's very well correlated with a pyruvate. So it would be a product originating directly from pyruvate. This is the table that summarizes all the results. I don't expect you to read it. That's, that's here in this plot. So we have shown how you can go directly from CO2 through a train of reactions to produce glyoxylate. You can carboxylate produce lactate, oxidize it, and start having compounds for the cycle. Now, the reactions in blue have been shown. All those blue compounds have been observed. Uh, the interesting thing is that we have provided a shuttle step that allow you, allows you to skip several of the, uh, of the pathways in the lower half of the, of the cycle here. The, the reactions in black, or the compounds in black, have not been observed yet, so there is a still a new chemistry that has to be discovered. 
and the pathway in red I have suggested as possible in a theoretical study, that it was my first uh, uh, research work at Harvard as a postdoc. Uh, we have observed our zinc sulfide to have certain selectivity, uh, as I explained for the reductions, uh, also for competitive reductions like the reduction of malate back to oxaloacetate would occur with uh, uh, would occur 23 times lower than that uh, of uh, pyruvate uh, to lactate. Sorry, the reduction of uh, pyruvate to lactate occurs 23 times slower than that of oxaloacetate to malate. And uh, I think I already explained, we have an, an aplerotic-like mechanism to start metabolism. Still, the final goal of this project needs to be accomplished by producing citrate and cisaco nitrate. Uh, I think there is applications of this into energy production, because right now we are running short of uh, fuels. Uh, we are consuming our reserves. We have a larger dependence on uh, foreign sources of, uh, of carbon, of uh, uh, gas and uh, petrol. And uh, as I say here, I propose to generate an alternative to photosynthesis. Many researchers are, try, are trying to reproduce photosynthesis. I would try to focus in reproducing carbon fixation pathways. Now, for the future, we would be able to use enzymes because I don't have any more the limitation of trying to do something abiotically. Can we have a minimal walk, as I explained earlier, from the engineering point of view to fix carbon for, uh, for fuels? And uh, we need to discover what, what's the efficiency under the different conditions and identify <coughs> the bottlenecks uh, for, for these processes. Uh, so a typical goal for a, a research project would be to optimize uh, the catalyst for maximum carbon fixation and this could be done uh, in the gas phase through heterogeneous catalysis trying to fix CO2. Uh, photoelectrochemistry is more active in the gas phase or we could also try to do experiments in, the, in, in aqueous uh, solvents. Uh, there is a lot of uh, characterization that has to be done of the mineral synthesized and a lot of uh, chemical uh, testing is needed. So as I said, we could combine step of different mechanisms and we could uh, overturn the negative uh, predictions through thermodynamics that don't account for the catalysis uh, and the use of light as our source of energy. This would be a typical setup of an uh, experiment and uh, of course, this setup could be adapted. We could use H2S, uh, nitrogen, and try to fix it. Zinc uh, sulfide is provided uh, as uh, cells for infrared uh, spectroscopy, for example. We could also synthesize our own. And uh, quantifications could be easily done by gas chromatography and infrared spectrometers. Now I will move into my second part of the talk, the applications of, uh, of my PhD work for uh, atmospheric uh, aerosols and uh, I think everyone in the school is familiar in the department with the importance of uh, aerosols work. You have a, a world experts working in uh, the effect of uh, aerosols uh, as a health hazard in urban environments where they are present in large uh, concentrations. You have people in the department also interested in the visibility concerns how aerosols scatter and absorb radiation in the visible. Uh, there is the most important uh, effect from my research that is uh, the radiative effect on climate and also that aerosols provide place for surface chemistry uh, or condensed phase chemistry to occur. So from the uh, intergovernmental panel of climate change, aerosols present the largest uh, uncertainty in the radiative balance of the atmosphere. And these are some of the questions I wonder when I started with these projects. It's only gas phase of uh, uh, organics important in the atmospheric aerosol. It seems the majority of models uh, and studies focus in the gas phase processing, but in the last few years, I would say the last five, seven years, 
there are important discoveries that point to the importance of uh, also uh, condensed phase chemistry. And uh, another point is if organics, uh, small carbonyls, are the degradative endpoints of the organic matter present in the, in the atmospheric aerosol, my answer to this question in advance is not. I will show how there is a recycling of organic matter. What's more important, uh, primary or secondary uh, emissions uh, from the uh, urban point of view, uh, I just had a very interesting conversation uh, with Costas. He's convinced that secondary is more important. Uh, in the global scale, uh, we have to think it's still under discussion. And uh, if the thermal accretion of carbon is it's possible, that's another question. Barsanti and Panko uh, explain, depending on the structure of the carbonyls, thermodynamically this will be favor or disfavor for the different carbonyls. And a big question is how do these polymers, organic uh, macromolecular uh, material that is present in the atmospheric aerosol, forms? And this is where my research can have an impact. And uh, uh, the research hypothesis that what I will be addressing now is that color organic substances may be produced in the tropospheric aerosol by heterogeneous photochemistry of decarbonylic compounds, like for example pyruvic acid. That's it's an alpha keto carboxylic acid. So, what's the what kind of organic matter I found in the environment? Uh, if you take a sample of uh, natural surface uh, waters from the ocean, from a lake, rivers, you will find that the aromat the the organics are more aromatic, and the average molecular weight is around 450 daltons. While if you take samples of atmospheric aerosols or snow packs that scavenge atmospheric aerosols. Uh, the organics will have a more aliphatic character and the average molecular weight will be below 1,000 daltons. Inclusively in ice cores that preserve the organic matter scavenged by ice, uh, different organics have been found, like for example, alpha ketocarboxylic acid, pyruvic acid, in this concentration. So this is a compound that is present in the atmosphere or that is produced in situ through the direct photoxidation of isoprene of aromatic or the complex organic matter that is present in the atmospheric aerosol or the humic substances that are present in surface waters. This is a study where Kawamura reports the abundance of these small uh, decarbonylic compounds in the Arctic aerosol, a pristine environment. It's orders of magnitude larger if you come to a polluted urban environment where pyruvic acid is one of the most abundant only behind of course, glyoxylic acid and the most abundant always oxalic acid. So pyruvic acid is present in the environment and we have chosen it as our probe to study photochemistry in the condensed phase as a first approximation of what happens in the atmospheric aerosol. So we propose that the photopolymerization of carbonyls is possible to form these humic life substances in aqueous medias. Uh, there is a problem that carbonylic compounds will only absorb in the UV uh, range of the spectra in the gas phase. But the carbonylic compounds, because of the structure, will also absorb in water. Above 300 nanometers, the wavelengths of uh, relevance for the atmosphere. Uh, uh, in water, the carbonyls undergo reversible hydration into gem diodes that don't absorb light and cannot uh, promote the kind of chemistry I will show, but pyruvic acid is present in a 35% as a carbonyl and it will be a typical uh, um, organic acid that absorbs light uh, above 290 nanometers. Here you have different organic acids that are present in the atmospheric aerosol and only pyruvic acid absorbs in this, in this range. The other aromatics you can see that there is no considerable absorption. So we care about the carbonyls and the problem is still worse because as you go up in the troposphere you will lose 0 0.6 kelvins per 100 meters of altitude you, you gain. So you will end up having a lot of ice also uh, conditions, icy conditions. And these NMR images show the typical microenvironment where unfrozen water will remain in ice, will concentrate those organics, and very interesting chemistry happens there. And we chose to study this 
the, this reversible hydration equilibrium in ice through solid state nuclear magnetic resonance. The concentrations of the carbonyl uh, that absorbs UV light and of the gem diode that does not promote photochemistry are proportional, directly proportional to the areas under these curves and we could quantify the ratios and we concluded that inclusively down to minus 35 degrees Celsius you will still have 20 percent of the for photoreactive form of the carbonyl form of uh, pyruvic acid and of course as I said earlier 35 uh, percent at room temperature in water so there is photoactive form of pyruvic acid and these are some photos of the uh, reaction experiments we produce a one millimeter ice layer in the photochemical reactor we could go down to minus 70 but experimentally we only work ma to minus 50 degrees and we studied this chemistry in ice and in water a uh, real-time monitoring of the gases in our photochemistry was uh, performed through FTIR the reactor was condensed to a vacuum pump through a, through a vacuum uh, line and to the FTIR through a micro pump to have real-time monitoring the air was circulated every four seconds and how did you how did we simulate atmospheric light -like conditions we assume a relative humidity for example 50 percent and we have the the liquescence curve of uh, ammonium bisulfate one of the most abundant uh, inorganic salts present in the atmospheric aerosol so we obtain the ratio of uh, inorganic to water we have from Kawamura the ratios of decarbonyls to sulfate in different environments so if we are in a pristine or polluted city-like environment we'll have a range of 20 to 200 millimolar pyruvic acid we work in a range of concentrations relevant concentrations we radiated with light above 300 nanometers and we could regulate the light intensity to be in the order of uh, uh, that of the sunlight and we always work under desired uh, gas atmospheric conditions we could work under oxygen under nitrogen or under one atmosphere of air a typical analysis were performed by HPLC with negative ion uh, mass spectrometry detection this is pyruvic acid the two main products A and B uh, uh, we also perform collisional induced dissociation increasing the voltage of the fragmentator we could produce cleavage of the of the compounds I also synthesize the compounds I will show uh, in a minute uh, the HPLC also had UV detection so we could uh, record the UV spectrum of the species species A doesn't absorb in the UV while species B has a carbonyl at 280 nanometers we also use identify reaction intermediates through electron paramagnetic resonance in ice you would expect the total uh, amount of pyruvic acid to be present as a dimer there will be electron transfer in those dimers and we identify two different kinds of radical pairs this one separated from one to two has a, a distance the electrons are in the carbonyls and uh, the distance is in the order of nine Armstrongs now if the electron transfers occur through a uh, inter a uh, dimer monomers in inter -dim dimers through a water molecule the radical pair identified uh, corresponds to 4.5 to 5 Armstrongs and uh, because the radical cation will release a proton it decomposes in picoseconds to acetyl radicals and of course uh, if it decarboxylates to CO2 the radical anion has a very high pKa will get protonated to produce a ketyl radical and these are actually the radical pairs we have identified with all the previous information the identification of the products that are A and B here I made it a little simpler I'll just show you now the products uh, with the kinetic experiments that I, sh I have not shown because of time constraints the use of tempo scavenger there is no time for that either and the comparison of the water chemistry to the ice chemistry 
uh, we propose the following reaction mechanism. Pyruvic acid absorbs a photon, the singlet excited state is produced, there is an intersystem crossing, the triplet can attack another ground state pyruvic acid, the radical pair is produced, the radical uh, cation the protonates and the carboxylates, the radical anion high pKa in the order of 12 will get protonated to this ketyl that can recombinate with another ketyl to produce a product that is transparent to the UV uh, of six carbons and uh, it's 2,3 dimethyl tartaric acid or could react with another pyruvic acid to produce a radical intermediate that with acetyl produce an intermediate that decarboxylates in, in ice. We have followed that reaction in ice uh, in the beta position to the carbonyl and produces this species B that because of this carbonyl absorbs at 280 nanometers. The big news for the community was that a mechanism that involves a the molecular initi initiation process was involved. Uh, now I'll move into the last research we have done. Uh, we were trying to simulate daily cycles of uh, aerosol photochemistry in the condensed phase. So this is the scheme of the, of the experiments. We'll have our pyruvic acid sample, uh, photolysis. Later we will allow our sample to undergo a thermal uh, reactions in the dark that will end up generating this color uh, compound, yellow brown compounds. Later we could photo bleach those samples again and uh, see a series of reactions this way and this is shown in this UV uh, visible spectra. So this is our original pyruvic acid in a concentration of 80 millimolar. If you photolyze you'll have this sample. We, we see that the absorption decreases, but if you leave it in the dark, you have the blue line here, the absorption properties increase, and if you dilute it, again you are breaking some supramolecular interactions and the, the, the absorption decreases. Now this is more relevant when you add ammonium bisulfate at high concentrations as it's found in the atmospheric aerosol because if you start by 80 millimolar here, this scale is different than this scale, now it's 3 here. If you start by this curve in black, this is your initial pyruvic acid, you photolyze it, you'll have the blue curve, but you leave it uh, for uh, overnight, you'll have a huge color development. And this is very important and of high impact for the radiative properties of the atmosphere. This absorption is 10 times larger than the initial compounds. And the only difference is that we just added the inorganic salt. We have followed the same uh, uh, experiment through mass spectrometry by direct infusion in uh, electrospray ionization mass spectrometer. And we see that after photolysis, leaving the samples in the dark and rephotolysis, again, there is no much change in the, in the peaks in the, in the mass spec. There are some differences later, but again, at, uh, the f for the last two stages of our experiment, the, the mass spectra is similar. So it seems there is no correlation between the UV properties and the mass uh, of these compounds. Uh, we have also followed the total organic carbon uh, evolution of these uh, reactions. There is large decarboxylation uh, in the beginning of the reaction. Later, the reaction stays stable over time. There is no more uh, decarboxylation. So here is the initial decarboxylation I show, the photoprocesses and the dark thermal decarboxylation I show in the previous mechanism. From there on, it seems the organic matter stays the same from the point of view of total organic carbon. Uh, similar occur similar Processes occur when you monitor the uh, abundance or, or the average mass of these samples. I think I am uh, going to show now the, the mechanism of polymerization of what we observed here. This is from the previous mechanism where you, we have the uh, ketyl or alkoxy radical that is in resonance with this ketyl radical generated by the previous mechanism with the acetyl. I showed earlier, and how these three species, 
in the presence of pyruvic acid or the enol of pyruvic acid can generate radical intermediates that generate this low volatility organic compounds that are polyfunctional that have uh, ether uh, OH structures or carbon structures that absorb uh, in the in the UVBs through supramolecular interactions and that can generate this kind of polymeric material. Uh, we have shown that the photochemical cycling of uh, organic matter in the atmosphere is possible. As I said earlier, pyruvic acid can be produced from complex organic matter as a degradative compound, but now we are showing how from this small decarbonyl you can generate back larger uh, macromolecular species and this would be represented by uh, thermal reactions that occur in the night time or photo bleaching that occurs during the daytime. For example, um, absor absorption would be given by this kind of lactam uh, structure that is produced through the dehydration of this OH uh, group bound to carbon, bound to carbon by, bound to uh, hydrogen that produces this uh, olefinic structure with carbonyls that absorb in the, in the UVBs. We have provided methods for quantification of uh, carbonyls in ice. Uh, contrarily, if there is light, this, uh, this absorbing compound will be photo bleached. The double bond will undergo cleavage into this transparent that it's, that it's uh, more transparent and doesn't have color. We have identified uh, radical intermediates in ice, in water, uh, we have proposed the mechanism in both medium and we have uh, provided the quantum yields for these reactions. That's very important for the photochemical point of view. A different application of my research I will not talk about now. It's uh, ice core records. Uh, through the mechanism I proposed I was able to explain anomalies in ice core records from the Greenland ice core project relevant, uh, relative to reliable results from the Bostock call for the last thousand years and uh, we have been able to discard the hypothesis here uh, number one through three the acidification of carbonates, the chemical production or the biological oxidation of organic compounds for the excess CO2 and CO detected in those uh, cores and we have proposed the photolysis of organic matter by Cher Cherenkov radiation of cosmic origin as the, uh, the reason for those anomalies. This is the correlation between the excesses of CO2 and CO during the last thousand years. Uh, this is to explain the Cherenkov radiation. There is no time for that. If you are interested, I'll be happy to talk about that later. And there are still plenty of questions to investigate about the atmospheric aerosol. And the last goal would be what's the overall impact of condensed phase chemistry occurring in haze aerosol, in clouds, fog water, and ice uh, to climate. A different project I am interested on, it's a water treatment. I can use all my photochemistry and photocatalysis knowledge for water treatment. Nowadays we face a problem with different kinds of pollutants. A new class of pollutants that are present in lower concentrations in our natural waters and they represent a risk for uh, human health. So these are the traditional ways of uh, advanced oxidation processes for water treatment and I am interested in those and I can apply them based on my knowledge. Uh, I can apply photocatalysis, TiO2 is great for oxidation, zinc sulfide was great for reductions, T TiO2 is great for oxidations, degradation of organic matter, it has been suggested as a good technique inclusively to clean up water from possible bioterror attacks it's good to clean bacteria, viruses, cancer cells. Now the problem is that these birth control hormones that have been identified since the early 90s in, uh, in natural waters uh, will escape those advanced uh, technologies and I propose uh, adsorption, selective adsorption of those compounds. This is an engineering problem 
and uh, uh, these pollutants are quantified. There are solid phase uh, extraction techniques to quantify them through UPLC, HPLC, MSMS, and we need to prepare in the in the laboratory uh, receptors like those that we have in our cells to bind those pollutants and separate them in a later stage of water treatment. After we have gotten all the pollutants, the majority of pollutants out, this should be the last stage of water treatment. Adsorption will fail if you work with alumina or silica gel because this kind of uh, hormones will not bind. But if you, th if you see how our organism works and binds specifically to this kind of uh, hormone structures, and we can simulate that through imprinted uh, molecular polymers, we can create cages to capture those target molecules. We can have that cage release our target hormone and later use it to take those pollutants out of the environment. That's a project I am very interested in. These are the things we, knew we need to, to run this kind of uh, project in the laboratory. And, uh, and again, UV light could be necessary as an initiation for the polymerization. I would, like, I would like to now thank my postdoctoral advisor, Scott Martin. This is in a whale watching trip we had in the Boston area. Everyone in the Martin group, Dimitar Sasselov from the Harvard Origins of Life Initiative. Uh, my PhD advisor, Michael Hoffman, uh, AJ Colusi, who I closely work with during my PhD too, the director of the Environmental Analysis Center, Nathan Daleska, Son Jung Huang from the Solid State NMR facility at Caltech. My uh, uh, PhD work started with the Vito Manoni Fellowship from the Endowment of uh, Environmental Sciences. I say his name, maybe someone knew Vito Banoni. And, uh, uh, support from NSF, NASA from the Astrobiology Program for my postdoctoral work, and the Origins of Life Initiative from my postdoctoral fellowship and the International Astrobiology Society. Thank you very much, and please, if you have questions, let me know. All right, I suppose we have questions uh, to our fellow. Any questions? Yes. Uh, in the first part that you were talking about, the um, thinking about the uh, creation of the biochemistry of life. Do you think of that as happening before uh, membranes, uh, micelles developed, or uh, did that happen within the cell after the micelles? Excellent question. Uh, the origins of life field is divided generally into, and I I'll take a minute to address your question, into RNA first, metabolis first, and there is another vision that it's the uh, membrane vision, the self contain a chemical reactor. Now my vision is that you need all of them simultaneously. So you cannot have life without metabolism and without a genetic machinery. But uh, what we are proposing here is that maybe this uh, interesting organic chemistry happened in the environment driven through those minerals. The organic molecules were generated and later the first cells took those compounds that were really available and abundant in the environment. So I would think that uh, the precursors to enzymes were very small semiconductor minerals that were encaps encapsulated in these uh, vesicles, bilayers, cell membranes that instead of using enzymes use maybe a semiconductor particle or a collection of them that could work synergistically uh, for driving their uh, redox chemistry and their photoredox chemistry. Um, excuse me. You talked about part of your research on, on biomass production. Uh, how does carbon sequestration fit into your team? So I was thinking. Um, the direct production of fuels. So more than carbon sequestration, if, uh, if I can prove methanol, formaldehyde, and formate are directly produced through 
photoelectrochemistry in zinc sulfide or cadmium sulfide. So starting from that point of view, if you already have methanol, you have a you have a fuel in a certain way. Now, if I could produce in the gas phase methane and ethane, maybe propane, you have readily available compounds for our uh, combustion. So I'm, I, I was not thinking about carbon sequestration for storage, like in a, from the geological point of view, but more for really available compounds for uh, supplying fuels. Yes, yes. So I would expect a, a EPA, the Department of Energy, to be interested in this kind of research. The last question is because we have a busy agenda from Arturo. Uh, okay, you uh, propose using the uh, photocatalysis on minerals as a source of organic material. So this would be a solar energy. Uh, Approach. Do you have any idea yet well, how that would compare in efficiency to solar panels as they exist now? I, the, the challenge is that I can show high efficiencies for starting carbon and products. So if you can show an efficiency of 10% from the photochemical point of view, it's large. Now, your problem, my problem, sorry, is that the photo efficiencies are low. Uh, photo efficiencies could be below 1%. Uh, from the energetic point of view, if it doesn't cost me energy, it's not a problem. If I, if I use photons from sunlight, it, do, it doesn't cost me, and I would have to make the calculation now of uh, how much energy I put into the system to compare it with the uh, solar panels. Well, the important question, though, would be how big an area for your approach be larger, smaller than the area for a solar panel that's produced the same amount of energy? I th it's a very important point of view, and I will have to address it anytime soon before submission of, a, of proposals. Thank you for the observation. Thank you very much, Marcelo. So I think we should thank Marcelo again for his interesting comments. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to take you to uh, the next meeting. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope.